Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Granite Rock's sixth product knowledge seminar. My name is Jackie Serrano, and I will be your host today. For today's seminar, we have a very special guest who is an expert in the world of concrete. We hope you are all as excited and ready to learn as we are. For everyone's information, we will be recording this session in order to grant replay access to those who are unable to join our live event today. With that being said, I want to remind you all about the amazing features available to you through our product knowledge seminar dashboard. From the dashboard, you are able to replay all the past sessions at your convenience. You can take our surveys to help us improve and in exchange for your feedback, score some free Granite Rock gear. You can also access relevant documents that will enhance your professional development. Before we get started, we ask everyone to please keep yourself muted and camera off. The chat is open, so we encourage questions or comments throughout the meeting. If you happen to have a question, please add it to the chat section and we will try to answer them as soon as possible. I would now like to introduce our expert guest speaker, Max Morgan. Max is currently works with our materials team as an account manager helping service customers. He has been lucky enough to be with Granite Rock for almost a decade. He went to CSU Chico State to study concrete industry management, and that is where he learned all about material sciences and concrete operations. Max is interested in building great relationships and helping Granite Rock deliver quality and responsible products. On his time off, he likes to go outside and write anything that goes fast or scares moms. Max, is there anything else you would like to add about yourself? Uh, no, thanks for the uh, generous introduction there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll kick it off to you now. You can start with your presentation. Great, I'll uh, share my screen. So thanks, Jackie. So again, my name is Max Morgan, and I am a account manager sales rep for our materials division. Today, I'll be covering uh, concrete for these uh, for our project knowledge seminars. Can you guys see my screen here? All good, Max. Perfect. OK, so overview of what I'm going to cover today. Um, why concrete and why concrete is relevant? What is concrete? So um, the components of that, which are aggregates, cements, admixtures. Then touching on different important properties of concrete, followed by some best practices and rounding out with green concrete and how Granite Rock is handling that. So starting off with why. Um, really, if you think about it, concrete is everywhere. Uh, whether it's your house, your home, or wherever you live, that's usually built on some sort of foundation, which takes concrete. Where you work, again, built on concrete. If you think about it, how you get around the base of that or in some component, um, concrete's involved, so infrastructure. Also, to transport goods and services, um, those transportations use infrastructure, which concrete has a piece in as well. So. Really, you can call concrete the foundation of our uh, daily life. So what is concrete? Concrete's composed of three primary ingredients. Cement, which is like the glue or binder. Water, to make that cement um, turn into a binder. And aggregates, uh, pretty much rock and sand that fills the voids in between. The quality of concrete depends heavily on the ingredients and the cement and water form the glue uh, that binds it all together. Here's a, a nice visual res representation of concrete, roughly 6% air, 11% Portland cement, which we'll get into what that is, 41% gravel or crushed stoned, 26% sand, and 16% water. Now this is very general, but it gives you a rough idea of the components of concrete. So to start it off, we're going to talk about cements. Um, now, they're technically concrete is any conglomerate that's held together with a certain binder. Um, what we refer to as concrete, the cement is a Portland cement. Uh, Portland cements are hydraulic cements composed of 
hydraulic calcium silicates. Uh, Portland cements set and harden by reacting chemically with water, and that process is called hydration. During hydration, each cement particle forms a fibrous growth on its surface and gradually spreads out to link up with other particles um, of cement and aggregates. So really, if you think about um, different crystals crossing, it that's what makes the strength of concrete. And um, this happens when water touches the cement particles. Here's a blown up view of different cement particles and their crystal growth. As you can see, um, you can see on the left different types of crystal formations and the the time that the crystals grow dictates how fast something will get strong and how large and how well interlocked determines how strong a concrete will get. So components of cement, there are about six different kinds or uh, components in cement. So gypsum, iron oxide, alumina, silica, lime, and other constituents. And depending on how these are blended, determines different types of cements. Uh, there are five common types of cements, um, but really the main component of cement is lime. To run over the different types of cements, one through five, type one is general purpose. Uh, type two is general purpose as well, um, but has different um, admixtures in the cement to help deal with a sulfate attack. Type three is similar to type one and two, but it's ground finer. And when the cement is ground finer, it reacts quicker to the water just because uh, the particles are smaller. And this helps um, when you need a higher strength concrete. Type four is used um, in applications where the heat of hydration needs to be minimized. Um, when you're working on very large structures such as dams, um, a lot of concrete together can actually get too hot and uh, negatively affect the concrete, even blow it apart. So um, this is where that is used. However, it's very rarely used. Um, we haven't seen it in our market. And type five is um, a cement used where sulfate attack is very prevalent. Um, and just to give you an idea of what we use here in our market, it's actually a blend of type two and type five. So a general purpose, but it has um, good properties to fend off sulfate attack due to uh, aggregates in the area. So how is Portland cement made? Uh, here is a little diagram of a cement kiln. Uh, the raw ingredients of Portland cement, like we said, are iron ore, lime, alumina, and silica. The main component is lime. Um, so the lime or is quarried. It's thrown into the top of this big kiln. Um, on the left, you can see bins. Those are fed into a, a large rotating kiln, um, which is heated to about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, all the components bind together and cook, basically, and form a product called clinker. Once that clinker has cooled, it is um, ground down into the fine powder, which is what we call Portland cement. Next is a, a supplementary cementitious material. So these are other products that are either hydraulic or non hydraulic, but work together with cement to gain strength as well as uh, improve the durability of concrete. So. Um, they're either natural products or byproducts from other um, production sources. Um, based on their chemical or physical properties, they can be classified as cementitious, such as slag or natural cement, pozzolans, so fly ash, type N or F, and pozzolanic and cementitious, which is a class C fly ash. Blast furnace slag. So what is blast furnace slag? It's the byproduct from uh, iron production, um, the, the parts that 
uh, get bounced out of, of the furnace, um, are ground up and made into a powder. Here's a little visual of how it looks compared to Portland cement. Uh, so it is a bit lighter and that can affect concrete. We'll talk about that later. Uh, like I said, it's a byproduct of iron production and like cement, it does have some hydraulic properties, meaning when it interacts with water, it will start to um, grow the crystals that we talked about. Uh, when used in concrete, it increases durability and strength, decreases the permeability and reduces the CO2 of concrete. So blast furnace slag, like other SCMs, work by combining with the byproducts from the hydraulic reaction of the Portland cement. Basically, it uses leftover alkalis to create more crystals um, due to the chemical makeup of this. And when it does that, you are basically um, gaining more strength with the same amount of cementitious material. And because of that, it's filling the voids in concrete um, that wouldn't, wouldn't have been there. So that decreases the permeability. Um, we'll talk about the CO2 effects of concrete later, um, but this does help to decrease that. Fly ash. Here is a little visual on the two different kinds. Class C, like we talked about, is um, a bit hydraulic, and Class F is not. Class C is mostly east of the Mississippi, whereas um, in our market here, we use Class F, which is more prevalent. Benefits to concrete. Um, so similar to slag, it has significant strength gains, uh, especially at later stages. It improves workability, reduces the bleed water in concrete, reduces the heat of hydration. It also uh, reduces permeability, increases resistance to sulfate attack, and also uh, resistance to alkali silica reactivity. So fly ash, just like slag, reacts with the byproduct from um, the cement reaction. Again, um, the reason it creates strength in later stages, it doesn't react with the water up front, it reacts with the cement reaction. So that has to take place and then fly ash starts to go to work. Um, again, this helps with permeability because it is creating more crystals with um, same amount of cementitious material. And when fly ash is reacting with the byproducts, it takes away some of the free alkalis in the concrete, which um, those alkalis sometimes can interact with certain aggregates um, that creates pop outs. So it helps decrease that. Here's a little close up of cement particles. And the reason why fly ash helps with workability um, is the particle shape and they're shaped like mini ball bearings. Uh, so when you're finishing the concrete, uh, you'll feel that it's a bit smoother or creamy on top. To explain alkali silica reactivity a bit more, uh, cement alkalis react with silica from the aggregates to form a gel. Um, and when the gel swells, uh, due uh, from absorbing water that causes uh, reactive aggregates to pop out. So really the the aggregate forms a gel and that expands and that pressure has to go somewhere. So it's actually strong enough to pop out the concrete, which is actually which is obviously not good. Moving on to mixing water. So almost any natural water water that's drinkable and has no pronounced odor or taste can be used as mixing water. However, excessive impurities in mixing water uh, may not only affect set time, but also affect strength, cause efflorescence, staining, and corrosion of steel. So you have to be careful uh, of what water you put in your concrete. Um, you can use recycled or slurry water, but it depends on how much. There's also standards to help govern that. Um, so what you have to do is, is test con concrete taking the control and um, using any recycled water that has to be the same strength within 90 percent at seven days or the set time has to be similar um, either one hour early up to an hour and a half after control. Also a piece that you have to consider is uh, the chemical limits. So 
um, for certain um, either pre-stressed decks has to have a certain parts per million or even the makeup has to be limited and tested. Moving on to aggregates. Max, um, we have a question. Um, yeah. If granite is using recycled water to batch concrete, what do you do to neutralize it? So we have a couple different operations. Um, in certain areas, it is settled so that the one the solids are out of the slurry so it, that it is uh, cleaner water. And two, in some locations, we do introduce admixtures to uh, neutralize any effects that um, leftover basically particles would have on, on new concrete. And we do test that regularly. We have a monthly test just to make sure that we are not affecting the concrete in uh, any negative way. Thank you. Perfect. Great. So back to aggregates. Um, the importance of using the right aggregate type cannot be oversized enough since they make up a majority of the concrete. 60 to 70 percent aggregates strongly influence the concrete's pressure mix and hardened properties, mixture proportions, workability, and economy. Um, when talking about different kinds of aggregates, you can generally classify them as coarse and fine. Uh, coarse aggregates are anything larger than a quarter inch, and fine aggregates are under a quarter inch, uh, usually referred to as sand. Aggregates must conform to certain standards for optimum engineering use. Um, really, they must be clean, hard, strong, durable products or particles. So, with aggregates, there are different size. The maximum size of the aggregates do affect the economy of the mix. Here's a little table to represent that. Um, larger aggregates allow to use less cement to achieve the same strength and slump. Um, the reason being, smaller aggregates have a larger surface area and require more water to produce the same slump. This means more water to cement to produce the same required strength or water cement ratio. Basically, the smaller the aggregate, the more cement you need, um, which means more water. So you get a better idea. Um, here's a representation of that. So if you think about this block, call it two inches by two inches, uh, the surface area is 24 inches squared and total volume is eight inches cubed. I think of this like as a, we'll call this a three quarter rock, even though it says two inches. Now, if you take the same volume, eight inches cubed, but split that two by two block into individual one by ones, the surface area doubles to 48 inches squared. Um, so if you put this in the context of concrete, let's say you're using a three quarter rock and go down to a, a half inch, the amount of cement and water to cover the surface area of the material increases, uh, which means to gain the same strength, you'll have to use more water and cement. Another component of aggregates that needs to be considered is the texture of the surface. So particle shape and surface texture influence the properties of freshly mixed concrete. Um, more than hardened concrete. And here you can see how surface texture affects uh, the voids between them. Interlocking properties are better for angled particles. So you, considering um, a smooth rock versus a crushed rock, a crushed rock, because mechanical properties of, of interlocking actually creates uh, more strength than a, a smooth rock would. When talking about aggregates, moistures really have to be considered. This is more on the batching side, but to kind of understand um, our process, uh, we first have to understand some of the different um, moistures that go into aggregates. Because um, when you when you make concrete, it's it's uh, sold by volume, but through our plant, we have to do it by weight. And the moisture in the rock really affects how much it weighs, as well as uh, how much free water 
is going on. So we monitor the moisture to make sure that uh, the correct amount of water is getting into the concrete. Um, oven dry moisture means that all moisture has been removed from the aggregate. Uh, saturated surface dry describes an aggregate that has as much moisture as it will hold. Um, however, the, the surface is dry or towel dried. Absorption is the amount of um, moisture that a rock can hold. Total moisture is the total amount of water in the aggregate. And free moisture is the difference between total and absorption. Um, so we take this into account, like I said, when we're batching to make sure that correct amount of water and weight is going into the mix. Characteristics of aggregates. Um, aggregates are usually described by their gradation and grading is the particle size distribution of an aggregate as defined as a sieve analysis. Um, so here you can see below, this is for a fine aggregate. Um, the numbers represent how many, the number of squares in a square inch. Um, and what happens is you stack these rings on top of each other, starting with four, followed by eight, 16, et cetera. Um, you place the material on, on the top, and then you shake the sieves all together, and material will be held on each level. And then you come back and record how much is there. So it gives you the distribution of the particle size on each sieve. There are common um, gradings for concrete and ASTM C33 really gives the guidelines for that. Um, common ones is an 08 gradation. So that's gonna be a 3 8 key gravel, essentially. A 5 7 is a one inch gradation. A 6 7 is a three quarter. Um, and then ASTM also gives guidelines for sand. So for granite rock, um, if, if you ever use our mixed designs, they'll actually start with the um, the rock size. So our mixes will be in either an 08 followed by numbers, a 5.7 or a 6.7. This kind of tells you that it's a pea gravel, a one inch mix or a three quarter mix. Um, one thing to note also with aggregate size, it's not just the economy of cement use, but also application in the field. So here's a small little detail to show why that matters. Um, if you have tight rebar, you really have to think about the, the maximum size of your aggregate. Uh, you want it to be smaller than uh, how far the rebar is spaced to allow the concrete to flow easily. Summary, aggregates need to be clean, hard, and durable. Need to conform to ASTM C33. Um, aggregates that don't will tend to be, uh, that do, sorry, uh, will be more economical and produce more workable concrete. And aggregates should have a proven history in concrete. Some aggregates which meet C33 will not actually produce desirable concrete. So we talked about cements and aggregates and water, uh, the last component of concrete are admixtures. So admixtures can be classified by their function. There are quite a few. There is air and training, water reducing, set retarding, set accelerating, uh, super plasticizers, uh, shrinkage reducing. You can also add color, corrosion inhibitors, and waterproofing admixtures. There are different standards that each admixture has to meet. ASTMC 260 is a standard for air and training, and ASTMC 494 for um, all the other admixtures. Going through the different types of C494 admixtures, there's type A through G. Type A is water reducing, type B set retarding, type C set accelerating, and Type D through G are different variants of water reducing. We'll get into them here. So starting with air entrainment, uh, air entrainment adds billions of tiny bubbles to the concrete. Uh, in fresh concrete, air bubbles act like microball bearings to help lubricate and reduce 
then um, internal particle friction. Air will reduce compressive strength by as much as five to seven percent, and it also reduces bleed water. The besides a little bit of finishability um, for using it, air entrainment is usually mostly used in freeze thaw environments. Um, we're lucky enough to not have too much of that around here. I think more of Sierras or places that have cycles of freezing and thawing the same day. And the reason why air entrainment helps there is uh, the moisture in the concrete when it freezes expands and all that pressure is enough to break apart the concrete. The air bubbles give basically a, a cushion where the the frozen moisture can expand without breaking apart the concrete. Uh, like I said, here we don't have too much of that, luckily. Here's a close up look of the bubbles created from the air entrainment. Now we're talking about air entrainment, but there's also air entrapment, which is just due to normal mixing. So the larger bubbles here are most likely that. However, the, the smaller, tiny uh, black dots on this picture here uh, are the bubbles. So and this is also in the cement paste where this happens. So effects of mixing water on air content and slump. Um, one thing to be cautious of if you're using large amounts of air entrainment is that increasing the slump will have a large uh, effect on that. So increasing the water makes more water available for the generation of bubbles, meaning more air. Um, as the slump increases to about seven, the air content will also increase. And one gallon of water will increase the slump by one inch and air as much as 1%. Uh, air is a, a tricky thing to really um, nail down. The reason being most other components of the concrete, even how fast you spin the drum, changes the air content. So uh, one thing to think about. Moving on to water reducers, there are different ranges like we saw in the types from ASTM uh, 494. There's low range, mid range and high range. These are used to achieve higher slumps without adding additional water. Um, adding water to concrete really creates a whole chain of effects that's negative for concrete, um, decreases strength, increases voids and uh, leads to other bad things. And use of high range or super plasticizers are also a component. Most of that is for um, large high rise buildings um, getting through tight congested areas um, of rebar. So to give an example of uh, how water reducers work. Uh, one, they make the concrete wetter, which is easier to place, but the secondary effect is also increasing the strength. To so get a visual of this, uh, this would be a normal mix, so 0 0.60 water cement ratio, um, call it 300 pounds of water to 500 pounds of cement per yard uh, to achieve about a five inch slump. Now, if we add a water reducer, we can take out 20 pounds of water, keep the same amount of cement in the same slump. Um, so you're affecting your water cement ratio, uh, decreasing to a 0.56, which increases your strength uh, about five to 600 PSI. So uh, good benefits here using a water reducer. The different types and ranges, so low through high, Water reduction is anywhere from 8 to 20 percent, um, and here are some typical dosages for that. Here's a picture of concrete using high range water reducers. Um, they help, as you can see, provide excellent, excellent workability while maintaining high quality and low water cement ratios. Moving on to set retarders. Um, they're also called hydration stabilizers, um, and they can delay the set of concrete from one hour to 30 hours. The performance is predictable and um, controllable even out to that 30 hour mark. 
Here's a graph showing dosages um, for hydration stabilizers. Really, if um, you're using this, it's probably summertime where the concrete's or the ambient temperature is hot. Um, we normally recommend dosages around one to two percent, um, but you're also able to ask us, you know, when ordering concrete. Um, so, in summary, if it's hot out, it's a good idea to add some recover. It really helps control the set to a, a normal time. On the flip side of that, we have set accelerators. Um, so, it affects the hydration and setting of concrete, which is a chemical reaction. Um, the accelerator basically expedites that. Um, rule of thumb is for every 20 degrees Fahrenheit and change, the set time changes by a factor of two. Um, and accelerators can help even out. So if it's, you know, 40, 50 degrees, uh, the concrete would be acting and setting very slow compared to at, say, 70 degrees. And this can help uh, speed up the concrete to more normal time. Main function is to decrease initial set time. This gets finishers on the concrete more quickly. So if you're running a job, it um, lowers your time finishing it, which can be helpful. It creates summertime set times in the winter, allows for placement and below freezing. Um, concrete really doesn't set much below 40 degrees, so using an accelerator helps extend the range. Um, we don't see that too much here just because our temperatures can be helpful. It's also can be optimized for early strength gain. So if you want to strip your forms faster or uh, a rapid set, um, which can be used in patching applications. Next admixture we'll be talking about is a SRA or shrinkage reducing. Here at Granite Rock, we use something called Eclipse. It's a result of a multi-year development with Grace and Arco Chemical. Uh, Grace is actually now called uh, GCP Applied Technologies. It's been in use since 1996. We've used it quite a bit. Um, prime Segments are bridge decks, containment structures, industrial floors, uh, marine structures, and concrete repair. We've also seen it used for topping slabs um, to help with curling and shrinkage. So let's understand what shrinkage in concrete really is. Um, even after hydration, concrete is still a porous material. So there is um, capillaries, small tubes throughout the concrete. Um, where when the concrete bleeds, it leaves um, an open void behind that. Here's kind of a close up between aggregates. You can see um, how the moisture sits between there. Um, when the pores lose water due to hydration and evaporation, um, and has become less than fully saturated, the water between the rocks form a meniscus. Um, and it forms out the water air interface due to surface tension. So what this is saying, if you think about when you pour water into a cup or even a beaker and you look at it flat, um, the water looks like it's curved because it's sticking to the sides. And part of that is the surface tension. Um, and that does have a, a pull, basically. So the surface tension of the pore solution, which forms the meniscus, also exerts an inward pull on the sides of the pore. These forces and all pores uh, range of 2.5 to 50 nanometers, and it's the primary cause of shrinkage. So really, the water between the aggregates pulling on itself um, creates enough force for the concrete to shrink. Typical shrinkage is about uh, 0.04 to 0.05% at 28 days. Uh, so how does Eclipse help that? Uh, with Eclipse, the surface tension of the pore water solution is significantly reduced, leading to a lower tensile force in all pores and less shrinkage. So basically it cuts, it cuts the um, surface tension of water to reduce that pulling force. It can reduce the shrinkage by as much as 80% at 28 days and ultimate shrinkage um, in an order of 25 to 50% overall. 
Here's a small graph to, to show you that. So reference in white, 1% eclipse in yellow. Green is 2%. Um, as you can see, the reference is about 106% at 14 days and um, can really cut that down. Most specs for low shrink concrete is around 0.04. So it really helps, um, helps us provide mixes to meet shrinkage specifications. Um, here's another example of a good application. So like I was talking about topping slabs, uh, this is a good use for Eclipse. It, because the concrete's not shrinking or pulling on itself, it decreases the amount of curling. And when you're pulling a, pouring a thin slab on top of other concrete, it really has nowhere else to go, so it'll curl. By using the Eclipse, it can help mitigate that. Here is a shrinkage bar. Um, so these are made from concrete and they are cured for seven days and allowed to dry for 28 days after that. Uh, every seven days, it's placed in this uh, machine here where it, it uh, records the length of the bar. <clears throat> okay, so we talked about um, admixtures, which is really that wraps up kind of the constituents of what makes up concrete. Now on to some common um, properties and kind of describe that. Concrete workability. Uh, workability is defined as the ease of placing, of placing consolidating, consolidating, and finishing freshly mixed concrete. Um, concrete slump. Slump is used to help um, communicate basically how the consistency of the concrete and what you want. Here's an example of how that's tested. Uh, so ASTMC 143 uh, is the test for this. Uh, you, you use a cone, fill it up three times, rotting 25 times each, each layer. Um, once the concrete is in there, you pull the cone off and the concrete will basically fall away and you measure from the top of where it was to where the concrete lies now, and that's your slump. Um, so on the left side, we have a low slump around a one or two, and on the right, something maybe an, an eight inch slump. Um, so if, if you need a stiff mix, it has a lower slump. If you need something that uh, flows well, it's a, a higher slump. However, um, slump is not always a measure of workability, although it's, it's an indication. Uh, two concretes with the same slump uh, can have, but have different aggregates, can have extremely different levels of workability. Uh, like I talked about, a low slump is zero to four inches. It's mostly used for pavements, slip forms, shotcrete. Uh, it's hard to place by hand, but it does give a good strength with low shrinkage. Higher slumps are generally used for applications such as block fill, walls, um, other areas with steel congestion and other tight areas. Concrete will flow easily, uh, but it does have a tendency to bleed more, water rising, um, which create, there is a possibility for segregation, and it does have a greater tendency to shrink. And all this reduces strength and permeability. Uh, the main reason um, for that is usually higher water content. Another property of concrete is the temperature. So like we talked about, when the cement um, touches water, that's a chemical reaction, and that does release heat. Whenever you increase the cement, it increases the heat of hydration, so uh, the heat from that chemical reaction. Um, and also like we talked about, um, using we can use admixtures to help mitigate ambient temperature. So because uh, the cement is a chemical reaction, the, the hotter the ambient temperature, the faster that reaction takes place. Uh, so we can play with admixtures to mitigate that. Another property is concrete strength. So strength can be defined as the measured maximum resistance of concrete to axle loading. 
Um, the principal factors are water cement ratio and age. Uh, water cement ratio is defined as the weight of water divided by the weight of cement. Simple example here, 250 pounds of water per yard um, with 500 pounds of cement yields a 0 0.50 water cement ratio. Um, and note that strengths increase with age and also increases as the water to cement ratio decreases. Uh, so it's something to watch for. To kind of put that in a visual, on the bottom is water cement ratio, and on the right hand side is compressive strength at 28 days um, in, in thousands. So common mixes are 0.50, which is right about uh, 4,500 PSI, which is very common. And that that's usually around a six sack. Um, so as you go up in cement content, you also go down in water cement ratio. Uh, how to test for strength? So you can use either six by twelve or four by eight cylinders. If you're using four by eight cylinders, um, you want to pull from the middle third of whichever load you're testing from. You fill the cylinders in two equal layers, rotting each layer 25 times for the mix to consolidate. Uh, those are placed in a cure room for 28 days. And then they're placed in a machine similar to the one on the right hand picture where they're loaded until failure. And that number is um, recorded as the strength of the concrete. Uh, so moving on to kind of best practices, we're going to start with proper finishing techniques. Um, so starting with tools, joints, and curing. Uh, tools normally used for uh, finishing concrete is a screed, bull float, and trowels. Here you can see two different types of screeding techniques. Most common is the one on the left. Uh, it's either a, a two by four or some metal uh, square bar. And this helps get the rough, rough height of concrete and slab. On the right, you have something that's not quite as common, um, but it's a roller screed. So basically a long roller is dragged along to help uh, smooth out the concrete. Another type of screed is a laser screed. This is used in applications where the flatness of the floor is very critical. It uses um, either GPS or other um, a set level to dictate the height of the level um, to create a very uniform surface. Uh, next, once the concrete has been screeded to a somewhat uniform height, um, flatten the concrete out with a large bowl float. Once that's been done, wait for the initial set and the bleed water to rise and dry. Then you come back and put the finish on the concrete. Yeah, this can be done either by hand or with machines. Uh, they even have ride on machines for very large applications. Uh, joints. Once the concrete's been uh, placed and finished, you have to consider what joints to use in concrete. Uh, the reason being is Concrete is going to crack, um, so by placing joints, you give you give it direction of where to go. Uh, there are different kinds: a construction joint, contraction joint, and isolation joint. Uh, construction joints are surfaces where two consecutive placements of concrete meet, um, stopping uh, places in the concrete during the pouring process. So, if you think about this, you have one pour one day. Um, you create a nice flush edge and then come back and pour against it. Uh, this is called a construction joint. Uh, you can actually bond the two joints by placing dowels in between. This helps um, share forces if it uh, needs to carry any. 
Next is a contraction joint. Um, so it's a intended to weaken the planes and the concrete and regulate the location where cracks occur, resulting from dimensional changes uh, will also occur. Uh, to, to, so this really controls random cracking and can be done after the concrete is set using a saw or actually hand tooled. So there's uh, tools to groove the concrete and by uh, placing that groove, the concrete finds the path of least resistance and follows the crack. The third kind of joint is the isolation or expansion joint. It separates or isolates slabs from other parts of the structure, such as walls, footings, or columns, driveways, patios, and sidewalks um, from garage lab stairs, light poles, or any other source of restraint. Uh, here you can see a column in the middle of a slab. Um, what happens is you, you place a small, um, compressible material between to absorb any changes in uh, length from around that to decrease any forces on it. Um, yo, so uh, one thing to talk about when cracking is that corners usually present the place where concrete wants to crack the most. So it's a good idea to um, to do what the concrete wants and place a joint there. Here you can see in the upper right um, exactly what I'm talking about. Um, there's reentrant corner creates a tensile stress and concentration at the corner of the slab uh, as it tries to linearly shrink and move in two dire directions at the right angles to each other. Um, so just something to think about when you're creating joints in a slab that when you have an L-shaped um, slab here, it is going to want to uh, crack right at that corner. Uh, here you can see that really, even if you place joints, that concrete's going to follow the path of least resistance and um, crack where it wants. Here's another example of the uh, restraint corner. Um, so, it's also a good idea to use different kinds of joints while um, using the same slab. So here's an example of isolation joints around the outsides, as well as the column, while contraction uh, or um, construction joints throughout the slab. Moving on to curing. Curing is the action taken to maintain moisture and temperature conditions in a freshly placed cementitious mixture to allow hydraulic cement hydration and pozzolanic reactions to occur so that the potential properties of the mixtures may develop. Really, it's keeping enough water in the concrete so that the cement can have all the reactions it can possible. There are many different types of ways to ensure that moisture stays in the concrete. There are chemical curing compounds shown on top here, um, sprinkler applications, or applying vapor barriers. Most common is curing compounds. Okay, so we talked quite a bit about components of concrete, um, concrete properties, as well as uh, best practices in, for placing it. Now moving on to green concrete and how granite rock approaches that. Um, granite green is what we're calling our um, ready mix concrete. Green concrete uses recycled materials such as fly ash and slag um, in place for mix with conventional Portland cement. Uh, it creates less, it uses less energy and waste, fewer greenhouse gas emissions, and has superior ultimate strength, durability, workability, and chloride resistance. So we talked about this in the beginning of the presentation, how um, using alternative cements uh, decreases the CO2. We'll get into that in the next one here, I believe. Um, Granite Rock uses locally sourced aggregates 
So this is environmentally superior to imported and foreign aggregates. It's local to your job site, taking less energy and transportation. Uh, we like to say the greenest mile is the one not traveled. Um, also, many of our mixes come with an EPD or environmental product declaration, which helps you get lead points for new projects. Uh, here's a composition of concrete like we talked about, air, cement, water, sand and gravel. Um, production and transportation of Portland cement is very intensive. So how we talked about cement being made, um, the energy required to heat the kilns that make the cement is so high that a lot of the CO2 production is from the, the energy required for that. Um, the other component is when the limestone is heated up, it actually releases CO2. Um, so that is a huge component of it. To put this in perspective, one yard of a six and a half sack Portland cement concrete is about 600 pounds of CO2, which is a lot. Uh, the way to make greener concrete is to reduce the amount of Portland cement in the mix by using the supplementary cementitious materials. Uh, like we talked about, they're byproducts and um, common ones are flash and slag. So talking a bit more about SCMs, they increase ultimate strength while um, can lower initial strength. Uh, the reason for this is you take out cement and say you put back fly ash, the, um, the only thing working to get the initial strength is the cement. So because you have a reduced amount, you'll have a lower strength up front. But the fly ash, when it combines with the byproducts from the hydraulic reaction, will make up that strength later on. Because you're taking out cement, it does reduce the heat of hydration, which can be helpful. Um, reduces the risk of alkali silica re reaction. Because you're pulling out cement, there's less free alkalis. Um, the mixes are more dense, so it increases resistance to sulfate, chloride, um, and also reduces shrinkage. Um, really, um, it's better for concrete to have less, less pores or capillaries. The reason being is materials or chemicals can tr transfer through um, water and get into the concrete. So by creating a more dense concrete, you're, you're inherently reducing um, the sulfate chloride and other attacks. Um, using SCMs can reduce the amount of water required, which is good, and it also improves workability. Um, to top it off, using SCMs can help with lead points. So locally sourced aggr aggregates um, reduces transportation impact. You have to think about the energy required to get materials to a plant. Um, so if you're coming from a closer distance, you're using less energy and CO2 uh, to, get the, to get there. Um, it's important to know where your aggregate come from, comes from. So for granite rock, we use all locally sourced materials. Um, imported aggregates fired five times as much as fuel compared to locally sourced. Um, granite rock actually uses a rail system and that's more efficient than trucking. So we do help save energy and CO2 there as well. And to make it even better, we like to use recycled aggregates, some applications to reduce um, transportation as well as um, virgin aggregates that we use. So I touched on lead points a bit. What is that? It is leadership in energy and environmental design. It's a green building certification program that recognizes best in class building strategies and practices. It was developed by the US Green Building Council, NSF. Uh, it claims 80% of current new commercial construction in the Bay Area is seeking LEED certification. To receive a LEED certification, building projects must satisfy prerequisites to earn points. 
for environmentally friendly strategies employed during the design and construction process, such as green concrete. Uh, there are different point levels and different tiers. Um, really for concrete, um, the main ways to get lead points are to use recycled materials as well as have locally sourced materials. So materials sourced within 500 miles and as much uh, recycled material as possible. Uh, EPDs, environmental product declarations are like a nutrition label for food. It spells out the environmental impact of each constituent. Uh, so here on the right, like the food label we're talking about, it um, it gives how much CO2 is release, released as well as other impacts. It's a third party certified life cycle assessment of every step in the production process from raw materials um, to being loaded in our trucks. Uh, rates each mix based on 515 criteria. Key standouts are global warming potential, which is starting to become a standard ozone depletion and water consumption. It allows consumer to compare the environmental impacts of competing products. Um, so other, basically you can compare how, how each concrete from different companies will impact the environment. Uh, Granite Rock is one of 16 suppliers providing this, and it does help qualify for, for more lead points. Using green concrete from Grand Rock can help with at least two points if you're seeking lead points. So two types of cement, like we covered before, hydraulic, which reacts with water, and pozzolanic, which reacts with the hydraulic reaction. Um, in hydraulic cements, it creates calcium silicates that react with water to form calcium silicate hydrate crystals, which are the crystals that we talked about in the beginning. Uh, that's what gives the concrete strength and it does give off heat. Um, it also produces free lime, CH, which is the byproduct that I've been talking about. Um, Pozzolanic is a siliceous compound that possesses little to no cementitious value, but react with the free lime, which is the byproduct, uh, to create more of the calcium silicate hydrate crystals. Um, like we talked about, flash and slag are primarily used in our market. Here's a visual to, of the reaction to give you kind of an idea. Um, SCMs react slower than Portland cement. Uh, the silicates and SCMs are uh, need to find and react with the free CH to form new CSH crystals. Um, the more CH present, the faster the reaction can take place, and it also depends on temperature. So uh, the cooler, the slower. A bit more on the chemistry. So they have varying amounts of lime. Uh, the more lime that it has, it's considered more hydraulic like Portland cement. Uh, so those are faster curing and can be replaced, can replace cement at a greater percentages. Um, slag has more lime, it's more hydraulic. Um, it's, so it's the fastest curing SCM and can replace as much of, as much as 70% of Portland cement. Fly ash is less like Portland cement, so it has more silicates and slower curing and less replacement, but it does create a denser mix. Um, really, you can blend all three and they can be optimized for projects to each project. To give a visual of the heat given off with different levels of SCMs, the yellow line is a control using all Portland cement. The dark blue line is cement with 25% uh, fly ash and the third is 50% cement, 15% fly ash, and 35% slag, um, dropping the, the heat down quite a bit. Um, this also 
shows with less heat, the slower the set. So that has to be thought about when placing concrete. Speaking about that, that leads us into our lessons learned. Um, we'll kind of share some of our practical experience from certain projects um, and when and what to consider when planning the project. Uh, main components are early age strength, slump, ultimate strength, shrinkage, special applications. Uh, the main thing to think about when using SCMs and green concrete is time. So here are a few key projects. Um, really, I'll, I'll touch on touch on a few here um, and kind of jump around. So starting with the Dumbarton Bridge, uh, that was a project where they required uh, high use of SEMs in the concrete, but they also wanted a really fast early strength. Um, after a lot of attempts, we just found that it it wasn't we weren't able to reach the required strength with such short time by replacing uh, cement with SEMs. The reason being, like we talked about, when you pull out the cement, that's really the the portion that's um, hydraulic and gaining the strength quick up front. So that was a good lesson there. Um, Half Moon Blade Library. The spec wanted a 50% replacement in all concrete, including shotcrete. Um, shotcrete is basically when you use high pressure to blow concrete to a vertical surface. Um, however, with the uh, less cement, the Shotcrete wasn't able to stick as well um, as using a more heavy cement mix. Uh, another one similar to the Dumbarton Bridge is the SFO long-term parking structure. The engineer had a very conservative spec, meaning uh, more strength required than really needed. Um, however, also wanted to incorporate SCMs. Um, so to meet that, Granite Rock had to incorporate SCMs, but to achieve the early strength, um, like the Dumbarton Bridge, we had to add the same amount of cement as if we didn't add in any of the SCMs. So really, you have to think about, it's good to, to ask for the use of SCMs, but sometimes um, if you can delay the, the set, you can decrease the cement, or uh, if you can design with a less conservative approach, you can decrease the cement as well. Um, one key thing to think about is because these mixes aren't going to set up as quick, it is left to the ambient um, environment. So a concern is plastic shrinkage cracking. Um, if you're not familiar with placing green concrete, um, you might actually trap the bleed water um, before it's ready. So it takes a lot longer to set, meaning the bleed water comes later, and this can have um, a bad effect on the concrete. This is um, so plastic shrinkage crackage. It's caused by rapid moisture loss, um, driven by wind. Temperatures, humidity, and direct sunlight. Um, what can happen with this slow setting material? The top will dry out first, while the bottom that's not subject to the environment will stay plastic. And once that hardens, it creates a force on the surface that's already hard, um, creating cracks. So it, it's something to think about when using green concrete. Um, you want to keep the evaporation low. So ways to be successful of using green concrete and not have plastic shrinking, shrinkage is check the forecast and temperature, humidity and wind, um, factor in exposure to direct sunlight. The job to geometry uh, might create a heat island in an area of placement. So windows bouncing light into a certain area. Um, a good way to help fight off is control the mix temperature. So to slow the hydration rate, um, you can use the set retarders like we talked about earlier. Slow the surface loss 
using vapor retired immediately after placing the concrete. So think of the uh, chemical carrying compound that we talked about. Decrease the potential for wind using barriers. Increase humidity if you're able to. And also postpone uh, placements until better conditions. Note that edges of placements um, are the largest area of potentially prone to, to issues. And also follow ACI standards for correct water cement ratios when placing on impervious surfaces um, such as visking barriers. So that was a lot, um, covered quite a bit. Are there any questions for me here? Max, we have a couple of questions here. Perfect. So the first one is, uh, how do I know what type of mixed order, five sack or six sack? Perfect, okay. Um, so depending on the project, sometimes you'll have an engineer who designates that, or if it's for more of a residential application, um, it depends on, on what it's going into. So for most, um, backyard patios and whatnot, you can get away with a five sack using a three quarter. Um, but if you're using, say, a pump that requires a smaller aggregate that might bump up to a six sack. So really, um, I mean, people like myself are here to help walk you through that. And it's dependent on, on your application. Perfect. And uh, the next one is, how long must I wait before adding a sealer to new concrete? Ah, so I believe it's, you want to add a sealer after uh, all the moisture in the slab has evacuated, which is usually around the 28 day mark um, for that. But also it's good to check the directions on the sealer itself. Some, some manufacturers may recommend something else, but usually you want the moisture out of the slab before you seal it up. Great. And then the final one that we have here is I've heard a lot about pervious concrete. How does that work? Perfect. OK, good question. So pervious concrete is concrete without any fine material. Um, all it is is a coarse rock, usually a pea gravel and cement faced. Um, it is placed usually in uh, flat work applications where you want the water to flow through instead of spread off into other areas. Um, the concrete is quite different than normal concrete. Uh, it's a very low slump. So we talked about a low slump being anywhere from one to four. Pervious concrete is usually a quarter inch. So it's very sticky and takes a lot of effort to put in place. Uh, once in place, it does require um, some special uh, tools, usually a roller screed, which is a big roller filled with water. And what that does is it provides enough weight to compact the material in place. Um, it is quite a tricky application and there are uh, specific courses um, if you're doing it for a, uh, say, a public project to get certified. Um, so yeah, if you have something coming up, we'd be happy to kind of help with that. But it's a, a porous concrete to help water flow through. Thank you, Max. So I think that concludes our seminar for today. Thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate your participation and hope it was of your liking. Please do not forget to take this session survey. Like I previously mentioned, it can be accessed through your product knowledge seminar dashboard. We also hope to see you all here next week, Thursday, May 27th, to further expand your knowledge on natural stone. Our guest speaker will be Steve Bosco from Beacle Stone. Same time as today, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Once again, I would like to thank Max for taking time today to share his knowledge with us. Thank you, Robert, for help, helping facilitate. That concludes today's product knowledge seminar. Be safe, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.